Okay, let's get started. Sorry, there's uh, more confusion. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> the, I think there's the cables are on the fritz here. That's probably what's going on. And somehow my, all my windows have disappeared. But I'll find them. That's the one, maybe. Ah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't show up on my other screen. It doesn't do that anymore on the on the new Mac OS, I think. Okay. So uh, I mentioned that we might do a, a condition variable implementation of the elevator homework. I decided it's not a good idea. Um, it doesn't actually illustrate the uses of condition variables particularly well. And we can do it just as well with barriers. Um, so let's um, maybe think about this. Um, like if we want to do a faster implementation of this homework, I'll just pull that up briefly. Um, let's see. Uh, these solutions. Oh, come on. I'll find it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I still haven't put it in the right place. So I'm trying to fit five. Yeah. Okay. So in this solution, we have um, one barrier per elevator, right? And then you have all your passengers are. Uh, are sitting with a with a lock around the elevator as well. So um, the problem with the solution is that we have no control over who gets this lock first. Right? So that's what we want to plan. We want to make it a little more efficient. So we were saying, okay, we can have a queue, or don't even have to have a queue. You can just have a table of all the passengers saying where they are, um, and we have a lock around that table. We fill in. The passenger information, we uh, release the lock, and then we have to wait until the, the elevator has decided to serve us. Right? So that waiting part there, well, we can do it with semaphores if we want. We can do it with, um, we can do it with condition variables. It's not probably the best idea here. Uh, we can do it with a barrier. So I thought maybe the easiest way to do it here: you have a barrier per passenger. So every passenger, in addition to saying where it is, it also keeps a barrier. Whenever it's ready, it wants to get served by an elevator, it waits on the barrier. Right? So now the elevators can choose. They can look at all the passengers in the list and they just wait on the barrier that's relevant for the passenger they're interested in. So that solves the problem very easily. There's no... Um, uh, we don't need to do any extra complication. And we'll see why I'm kind of avoiding condition variables a little bit later today, because they are a little hairier than all the other con um, the synchronization mechanisms in some senses, but it's also they're also a little easier in other senses, so um, we'll get there. Let's start with... Holy shit. There's so much static in your sweater. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's it, yeah. Oh my god. Not all that static. -y. Okay, so... Um, all right, uh, I promised there would be a, a bonus homework. Let's uh, just take a look at that. It's not a bonus homework, it's a bonus uh, a part of the same, but actually since it's five points, it's the same. It's, it's another bonus homework, I think. Aren't they five points each? Or are they yeah, six I points? Bonus? Five, yeah, so here you are. Wait, the homework is five points? The bonus is five points. Each homework is five points, uh, but now you do this bonus, you get an extra five points. So there you go, extra homework. Um, anyway, so this, I must not move too fast near the podium. Don't scare it. Yeah. <laughs> it startles easily, yeah. It's like those cats with fainting goats syndrome. You're scared of 
Pass out. <laughs> oh, I've seen it in goats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, here the idea is sort of like I don't know if you've gone to any classes in SEO around rush hour, but there's one door these days, and everyone tries to get in the door. But if there's people coming out of the door, then uh, you can't get in. There's a single lane, and they keep coming. You just can't in. So the department head for ECE he couldn't get to his meeting today because there was a student coming out, constant, uh, constant flow. So um, here the idea is, as long as there, it basically works like the SEO door. As long as there's more people trying to get out than trying to get in, well, then you can't get in. But then at some point, all the people got out. So now there's people trying to get in, more people trying to get in, then they can get in and you can't get out. So I've committed the template, and I apologize for all the little bugs in the in the previous template there. Um, I, maybe I'll just try, is there chalk here? <laughs> There's no chalk. Okay. Um, right. So I've committed the template here. There, there might be bugs in this template too. I, I'll take a look at it after. I, I just realized I forgot to ch test this one on Linux as well. So. Let me show you uh, just how it, because the, the, the evaluation, evaluation part there isn't quite done, uh, we don't have a way to test for, oh, is it switching often enough, or if it's, is it switching fairly, or that sort of thing. I don't have a way of evaluating that right, uh, right now, so I just wanted to show you what we expect it to run like. So this is the solution, how it runs. So you see, there's actually there's uh, there's ten threads in this test I think ten readers ten writers and you see it's it's doing most of the time but toward the end here it's deadlocked really yeah, that's not what we expect <laughs> <laughs> oh man so in the beginning it's all readers I have to uh, take a look at that some uh, <laughs> a little bit later in the beginning it's all uh, unless it takes a very long time because it wants to buffer up the entire document before it starts showing it there. So in the beginning it's all readers because I'm starting up the readers first. So they're all getting through nicely. But then some writers start coming in and now you see there was absolutely nothing for a while. So then there was probably quite a few readers for a little bit. Uh, quite a few writers, sorry, uh, maybe not. Anyway, so they're kind of taking turns there, but it's not always exactly 10, it's um, wh whichever there's the most of. Yeah, I did email these people about this problem. I, they asked me to call them when it happens, but I don't think we want to have someone diagnosing the thing when we're, when we're in lecture. So I'll just have to call them after. Okay. Um, so I'll try to come up with a reliable test. First of all, I have to fix my solution so it doesn't deadlock. This is a non-trivial one. It's kind of uh, challenging, but we'll we'll sort of get a start today with a with a similar problem. Okay. So last time we talked about this uh, reader writer lock. So the idea with the reader writer lock being uh, now we have only one person that wants to get in, I suppose. So with the SEO door equivalent, uh, I don't know if it works. Anyway, there's one writer, and you have you can have uh, you can run writer at a time, but you can have multiple readers at a time. You can't have writers and readers together at the same time. So this solution uh, uses semaphores to create a reader writer lock. Uh, so that the readers just count the number of readers that are already inside the lock. If you happen to be the first one, try to grab the right lock. So this is the lock that prevents uh, writers from, from getting the... From getting. Uh, then later on, after you've done some reading, after you're, after you're done, you decrement your reading count, and then if you happen to be the last one out, then it's your duty to release the right lock. So now the writer has a simple job. They just try to get the right lock to the right uh, to release the right lock. So this one has one very significant problem, and that's starvation. So 
But you could end up with a writer that never ever gets to write. There's a certain uh, behavior of the readers. Right? Readers, one reader takes over before one reader comes in before the, uh, the previous reader leaves, and you'll have a contiguous sequence of readers. They're always holding the lock. Writer never ever gets to go. So that's called starvation. There's a bunch of different kinds of starvation, but this is probably the, the most common one. So uh, what we need to do, and, and this is sort of halfway, maybe a quarter of the way to the solution of the um, alternating homework. Um, now we need to make sure that the writer gets to write at some point. We want to prevent the starvation of the writer. I'll let you think a little bit about this one. And I will take a little break so some other people can think about it too. Okay, read the next count. Such that when there's enough readers, we do not allow any more readers. Oh, okay. So you say when there's enough readers, you're saying if there's enough reader in the lock, but that doesn't help. That because, doesn't help. That doesn't help because there's reader, reader, and one drops out because there's a reader again. One drops out. Reader, you never go higher than say two. Yeah, two readers is enough to always. But you're still starving. Starve the writer. That doesn't. So instead, you have to increment any time that the reader comes in, and you only turn it to zero when something is done with writing. And you say that you max it out with this number at 20. So anytime the reader comes in, you increment this count. Oh, I see. So you're saying, OK, we can only do 20 readers at a time, uh, like back to back. And after that, it's the writer's turn. Exactly. Ah, oh, but what if you don't have a writer then? Then there is no writer. Is there you check if there's a writer waiting. If there's no writer waiting, because you have a waiting on for it anyway. We don't have just a way to check here if there's a writer waiting. Do you have a writer count? Writer count. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. If it's zero, then you. So we see. Oh, if there's enough writers. Now we're starting to talk about this. this uh, basically, the alternating solution. Yeah. It's enough that there's a single writer. We need a way to see, is there a single writer? So I suppose we can set the current seven four. We can set, set it seven four for you one. one or zero. And then if the writer hits it, then the semaphore is going to be zero. Oh no, never mind. Well, that's not so helpful. It's very hard. We're, in general, we're not supposed to read the values of semaphores. They're, because the problem is if you read it, there's no guarantee that it has the same value when you start using it. So and it's not the whole point of the sum of forces is that their operations are atomic. And so the weight checks and passes. Right? Um, sum of forces are not well, we, we're certainly going to use sum of forces to do this. But it'll be hard to see with a sum of force if there's a writer. Yeah. Okay, never mind. We can easily see if there's a writer. Just get write write your count block. Then inside this lock, right, there increment some count. And right after, there's a actual lock on the right. Let's see. Yeah, OK. So now we would have a, we have a separate lock. And we increment how many writers we have. Right. And then over in the reader, we see what now? If there is a writer, then we don't allow any read, more readers in. So actually, it would be enough to not have a writer to count. We just have to have a something that says there is a writer, but a count is probably handy because we can have multiple writers. And then we need to see, is there a writer? And if there is a writer, we should not be even going in here, probably. We don't want to We should actually stop up here if there's a writer. So what's that? Like the 74 so I think another solution that we can think of is what if we allow the writer to just stop the flow of readers coming in? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, 
semaphore door, for example, yeah. and right at the beginning, oh, never mind. <laughs> So remember the turnstiles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So started at one, then there's a wait, and then right after the, there's a signal. But then, if the writer waits on it, then they can't get through the first. Can a writer wait. start a reader? No, oh, there's only one writer at a time in this lock, right? So they can't really overlap. Okay, so that oh I. I minimized our previous solution. I'll keep that. Okay, so our new solution, we can put a turnstile over here. So I'll say turnstile dot wait, turnstile dot signal. Right, and then we'll start this. So so far this is all fine. The readers are just gonna come through. It nothing has changed really. It's just that go through this turn style. So how is it the first style? Well, we start at one, so the first reader can get through, and then it lets the next reader through. Right? You never have two readers in here. So not so doing the, anything that's that fine. The first thing right here will do is just be print style that way. Yeah. So, right, when we we know that when we get in here, we don't want any more readers. Right? This writer should now get in line right, to get the lock. And so we don't want any, any readers kind of jumping the line. So we'll do turnstile.wait here. Now the readers can no longer get in. They're blocked at the top. And then? Once we're done reading. Then. Exactly. When we're done reading, I, mean, I think we can do it either one, like we can do it here or here, but. Is that multiple writers? Or multiple writers? Multiple writers. Don't you want to finish a stream of writers before you start reading again? Uh, oh, I see. Well, so I suppose uh, that's a, something you could think of. Oh, maybe this is unfair, right? You have so. You have an equal number of writers and readers, and the readers get so much benefit. Yeah, that's not what we're trying to solve here. Starvation is you never ever get to go. So with writers, so it's still random. Don't though. get to go as often. What's that? It's still random. Like once a writer is done, it's random whether a reader or writer will get to go then. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not really a thing. But the, if a reader is going, another reader gets to go. So you can get like a hundred readers through, and only a single writer, and then another hundred readers. You could consider that unfair. On the other hand, the readers don't require as much. Like they're not as resource in, uh, demanding, so maybe that's fair. Who knows? Except that we can't read from I assume we can't set the semaphore to a higher number at any point in time after we initialize the network. Yeah, so we're really supposed to have three. There's all sorts of implementations of semaphores. You can always do what you want. It's a shame because I was thinking otherwise the writer could set a semaphore to say 20. And then the reader could do the constant weight on it, decrementing, and the moment it hits zero. It's easy to set it to 20. I mean, there's a difference <coughs> between setting it and incrementing it to 20. Right, I meant setting it to 20. Specifically ah. setting it. Because that way, anytime after the writer is done, you know that your semaphore is set read 20, so now you know that 20 readers can go in, but oh, they I have see. to wait the moment they hit zero. I see. I see. Right yeah. 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 So, I mean, we can do that separately, right? You can have a count. Um, and we use a semaphore for just the synchronization, and we use a, a, set, a protected count to, to maintain it. But yeah, that might be handy. I think the risk. Uh, you had that feature, is that you, don't, you actually lose whatever the count was before. Right. But you don't need it. And That's it's not clear. I mean, so it, it depends. In, in many semaphore, well, in many cases where we use semaphores, like it's very important that we get all the counts right. If you're off by one somewhere, it's like everything's going to screw up and you've got a deadlock. That's, I think, the main difficulty with semaphores. That it, you really got to get the puzzle quite right. Um, 
And that's relatively doable in these sort of academic exercises where you have uh, a well-known number of threads. We know none of these threads are going to die in the middle. And we have, you know, everything's in pretty decent shape and pretty small and controlled. If it gets a little more complex, and sometimes semaphores are not the best, or the most scalable solution in terms of code complexity. They're also not very fast because you always have to maintain the count. And so there's both the mutex, um, well, inside it's a, you have to do an atomic operation, right? test and set, and then we also have to increment this count, um, which would incur some extra overhead there. So um, sometimes it's better with alternative solutions, and, and uh, condition variables are one of those. So I think we've gotten to our condition variables finally. So they are a kind of a funny beast. And I'll admit I haven't had much experience with them myself. And so the, I've, I've been, I spent the last week here trying to figure out exactly like what is the story here? Why uh, should we ever use a condition variable and so on? So we'll try to <coughs> get this nailed down. So first of all, um, we, we started out trying to implement a condition variable with a semaphore in the past. Um, it's possible, but it's not necessarily a good idea. Reason being, semaphore, uh, condition variables are, are lower level kind of primitives. Primitive. It, it's, uh, it's faster to implement. Uh, it's more typical that you would implement a semaphore using a condition variable than the other way around. So they are sort of exchangeable, but, but uh, you probably want to go the other way around. Barriers can often serve instead of a condition variable. They're also a higher level construct. They're kind of slow. You keep a count. You, uh, you have to, uh, let's see, why else are they slow? Anyway, they're a little bit more complex. So. Uh, Oftentimes, it'll be easier to use a barrier. But then sometimes we have these situations where it's actually much easier with, with our condition variables. So let's see what they, what they do. A condition variable uh, has two, two functions. There's a weight, uh, three actually. There's a signal, and then there's one called broadcast. Okay, so the weight um, it does two things. You have to say uh, the variable, and then you have to pass in a mutex. And then for signal, you say which variable, and same thing for, for broadcast. So what happens when you, when you call weight on a condition variable, this being the condition variable? Um, well, you're supposed to hold the mutex before you start. So you need to get hold of a, of a lock, and then you call this uh, condition variable. And it will atomically <coughs> release the mutex. And wait. All right. So now it's waiting for someone to, um, uh, let's see, wait for signal. When the signal comes in, we acquire the lock again. So unfortunately, these signals, there's, there's a couple, well, OK, maybe we'll hold off on that. OK, so signals simply, uh, simply send signal to a variable. No waiting, no blocking. Usually, only one receiver. Okay, so you have two threads waiting for this uh, condition variable. Usually, if you signal the variable, only one of them gets the gets to wake up. Now, it's a little unclear there, but. Sometimes that's not the case. So there's something apparently in the standard that says you can get these spurious wake-ups. So sometimes 
you wait, you're waiting and you just wake up for some reason that's not entirely apparent to your thread at least. Of course, there's always a reason. And then you continue. That would be a problem, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so this makes life a little bit difficult, but there's an easy solution. Um, and then broadcast, same thing. Signal variable. All waiting threads wake up. It's the same story as with the with the semaphore. Okay. You don't you don't have to worry about it, but the it could be the OS uh, actually puts you to sleep until something happens. It could be that you're you're uh, spinning. Actually, we can implement right now. We can implement a, a basic wait um, here. Wait uh, variable mutex. While, let's see, I don't know while. We simply go unlock mutex, lock mutex, and that's it. So that's actually a, a correct implementation of wait. It doesn't wait much, but we know that sometimes <coughs> wait will return even though you didn't expect it. So it's up to the application to, to make sure it doesn't uh, get tripped up by implementations like this. So the person wants to make sure that whatever mutex is is not going to be else? Yeah, else? so let's think of, a, of an example of, of uh, what could be an interesting use for, it, for this stuff. So if we have a um, producer-consumer problem again. So a producer is putting stuff in a buffer consumer wants to get some stuff from the buffer. So for the producer, um, now we're not using semaphores anymore. We're using uh, something else that we'll say, uh, maybe buff.put, right? And a consumer should be buff. Uh, what is it? Push and pop. That looks nice. OK, so now. This is fine. The producer can just, whenever it has done something, it uh, pushes something on there. For the consumer, this is not fine because there may not be anything uh, on the stack here. So what do we do? Well, uh, we could say like, or oh, while something in stack, or if something in stack, oh, actually, it'll be while not something in stack. loop, and then we'll go pop, right? So this might be a, a, a naive, unsynchronized implementation. There's some difficulties here. What if you have two consumers? Right? So now you might end up with the producer pushing one item onto the stack. So two consumers, both of them wake up, and then only one of them gets to pop, and we have a problem. So, okay, of course, in order for this to work at all, we have to lock something. And these push and pop, uh, they could have locking implemented inside of them, of course, but let's say they don't. So, if we want to, for this to work, we'll have to say lock mutex here, unlock mutex there. All right, so now. When the producer comes in, it has to lock it to make sure that it's not... There could be multiple producers too, who knows? You don't want to have multiple calls to push or a call to push while you want a call to pop. That's kind of screwed. There is a deadlock. Exactly, yeah. So your producer seems to work. Your consumer may not work so well. Right? Because now we're locking the mutex and then we're waiting until there's something in the stack. But you need the lock in order to put something in the stack. So how would we implement this? I think if before when we did it with semaphores, we we stop ahead, we have a count, and we, we make sure that the consumer doesn't get to continue until the count for the whatever's in here is above zero, whatever's above in the set. 
So that's actually a nice solution for the producer-consumer problem. I would probably prefer to use that. But um, say we don't have those. So now we'll probably want to maybe we we go. I don't know what we're gonna do here. Can I just ask one question? Yeah. Because I have a pretty big problem with this. Okay. The way the the conditional variable is written right now, the, doesn't only one person wait at this time? Have you to wait where all up here? Or you mean down here? You don't have a con any condition variable so far down here. Yeah, up, up here. here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, any, anyone can call wait. Lots of threads can call wait. Yeah, but it's only one mutex. So someone unlocks the mutex, locks on it, but then another guy calls. Yeah, this is a really, really dumb wait. It doesn't actually really wait. But it's still a correct implementation. It's just going to be very inefficient, because what's going to happen? You have all these programs calling wait, expecting to wait for a long time, but actually you get right back, and then you have to call wait again, and again, and again. Oh, right. So basically, they're all spin locking here, yeah, which is very inefficient. But that's you know, potential. So maybe I should just, in case we look at these later on, really inefficient solution. Okay. So why would I? Why do I even? Uh, if I want to make a really inefficient one. I guess it's good to do those. If I want to make it a little more efficient, why don't I just remove these two? Unlock and lock. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, so it's a no. But it actually creates a problem because now whoever starts waiting, they're holding this mutex and they're going to hold it forever. They're always calling back to, to wait here. So anyway, we need, to, we need to finish this up and then they'll be clear. Okay, so, so in order to make this work here, we'd have to do like a while true and inside of that check the condition and have a, make an if statement and break out and, and then release the lock. It still wouldn't quite work. Actually, let's try it. So, so I'm saying like this, instead of locking the mutex there, I say lock if something in stack no. Oh yeah, break. <coughs> right? So now at least I'm not, and then I can, and I'm going to have to lock it again. So if you're running down because you, this sound because you think it's a good solution, no. Um, so here, at least, we don't have a deadlock. Checking once and we release it. So, but there's another problem with this solution. If we break, isn't it still locked? Oh, good yeah. point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. So I'll have to be a little more careful here. I'll have to say unlock. Oh. And then break. Very good. Correct now? Ah, that looks correct. I suppose, oh, 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 I see. Uh, the other solution, of course, would be to just ignore that. Yeah, because I can only ever exit. Yeah, yeah okay, very good. That's even better. All right. So, looks weird. Yeah. I don't know, we're over there. I can only ever get here, but right. So, nah, it's not bad. I mean, it's really inefficient, but it's not bad. It works. Okay, so if we want it to be a little more efficient, it'd be nice if this whole weight here didn't just spin all the time. So what we can do instead is we just say oh, 
we lock our mutex, and then we wait on some condition variable mutex. Okay, so so this does the same thing. I, I hold the mutex first, and now I'm waiting for something to happen. I'm told, I don't actually have to check for it right now. Someone else is going to tell me that it happened. So I release the mutex. This releases the mutex while I wait, and then I get it immediately when I wake up. So I'm guaranteed when I wake up, I am the holder of the mutex. But it kind of looks like I held it the whole time. OK, so we need one more thing here to make this work. Over here, when, once we put something in there, we have to do signal condition. OK. So now, probably, well, there's a few things that could happen here. Right? We're, we're, we're not in a good situation yet, unfortunately, because, let's see, did I write this correctly for the signal? Didn't write. Oh, I should say one more thing. I didn't implement it. That doesn't matter. Usually signal only one of the waiting threads what it should be. So there's the challenge. What if the producer starts up first? Put some stuff in the buffer, signals away, lots of stuff in here. And now the consumers wake up, they get the lock, and they wait, but the producer is, is done producing. Right. Now we have a debug again. Right? That's one potential problem. The other problem that we mentioned before is this signal here could actually wake up more than one consumer for some reason, strange reason. We don't have to think of it that way. We can also talk about the broadcast. Right. It's the same thing. The broadcast wakes up two of them. Same problem. So I'll say the producer here, instead of signaling once, it said broadcast, now you get two of them waking up. So now one of them is going to actually get something. The other one Owns the mutex when it wakes up, of course. So it's going to have to wait until the other one's done. Then it gets the mutex, and I've got to pop it in there. Yeah, so these conditions, these are actually, they're called, like, maybe I should make it a condition where it's not a particular condition, but yes, there's something that these are signaling. There's a condition that they are signaling, and we may need to make that a little more persistent. In order to, for this to work, we have to also store the, this condition somehow. So what is this condition in our case? It's, is there anything in the buffer? Right? That's what we're, what we're checking here. So we'll go like this. Okay, we'll take it. We hold the, hold the lock. No one else can remove it or put anything in there. 
set of remains, so we're good. In the case of an empty buffer, this hasn't run yet. Now we're checking, and now we're just waiting. And this wait could take a very short amount of time, or it could take a very long amount of time, but hopefully it will at least take a significant amount of time. Right? Hopefully it will save us some CPU cycles. Okay, so then at some point something gets put in the buffer, then this wakes up, we check the condition again, oh, but now there's something in the buffer, so we continue. What if you have two of these consumers running at the same time? They're both waiting, both of them wake up. Well, one of them gets to check there's something in the buffer, it pops. The other one checks, there's nothing in the buffer, so he has to wait again. Okay, so this is actually the case for condition variables general, you can only have consistent, like reasonable operation of a condition variable if these two things are true, or three things. I think you, I think you can't even call away with, without holding the mutex. So you have to hold the lock, you have to have some binary predicate, like a check, a condition that, that sees if whatever this condition variable is supposed to signal, is that true? You have to check for that separately in a while loop like this, over and over. And then finally, you have to hold the lock when you're send, sending the signal as well. So that when you call the wait for the condition variable, you're guaranteed that nothing is going to sort of jump in there in between when you're unlocking the mutex. If, if you say that wait condition variable mutex first unlocks the lock and then locks it again, uh, say there's two consumers waiting, one goes in, then the wait condition bar unlocks and the other one suddenly jumps back in, in there as well. So you can't have the same lock twice, right? I mean, you can't, can't have two people locking the same lock twice. Right. So, so then see. you're waiting. So I'm always locked when I come out of this. Right, so now I can check the condition. If the condition isn't true, then I have to go back back in. Oh, did, did you figure out what you were thinking about? I'm not sure what you're saying. So let's say we get stuck in between unlock and lock. Inside. inside. Oh, we get stuck here. So we get these hit. We're out. Someone else gets to run. Or how are we stuck? What? Oh, we're stuck because someone else is holding the mutex to me. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Because we're just waiting. Yeah. yeah. I kind of don't, you know how we didn't have while statement from the consumer? Yeah. How were we waiting? So this is, again, a very silly one. I understand, so, but yeah. even, even the silly one, like I don't really get how. So how are we waiting? We're, we're sitting here until the condition, until this condition is true. No, we had, we didn't have the while statement at all. Oh, without? Yeah, yeah, then we're not doing anything here. This is broken implementation. But, but we, we don't have the one. We continue, right? We yeah. just we just hit it once and continue. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so it won't work. Yeah. Okay. And so that's true in general. Now, these weights are not this stupid, right? So but that's a problem because they're kind of clever. They usually work the way you expect. You would expect when you start with a condition variable, you think, okay, I'll wait until I call signal, right? That's it. But it's not quite like that. So then uh, you don't run into this problem right away. There is a while loop here. With this weight, it just does not work. But with a clever weight, it'll work most of the time. But then sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so just not good things. It just seems kind of counterintuitive because this is using the lock generally doesn't include using any while loops. Yeah. And yeah. So. So when might this be a better solution than just using uh, a semaphore? Right? The semaphore seemed like such a, a nice uh, solution here. How would we do the semaphore? Here we say on the producer we should put, put some, we, I guess we lock it and we push some stuff in and then we signal the, the semaphore to raise it. And over here we wait for the semaphore, done, right? So when might this be a better solution? 
Is the overhead similar? No. Uh, these are these are a little faster. In fact, I'm thinking maybe the last homework will look at trying to make things fast, and that's one option. Like maybe trying a few different synchronization operations. But so let's think about not just producer consumer, but we happen to have another thread here. So third thread. That sometimes it's just poking the buffer. And it doesn't do the semaphore stuff. Right? It holds the lock, so it's correctly operating on our buffer. But it doesn't do the semaphore for the synchronization between the producer and the consumer. So now you're going to end up with. We have the, the third uh, guy here, like the thief. It just comes and takes something out of the buffer. In that case, the consumer, with our semaphore solution, the consumer is going to wake up thinking there's something there and just go for it. Right. That, that doesn't work. And you can't really put a while loop around the wait for a, in a semaphore. That's just going to decrement things and it's going to go completely nuts, right? So in, in this more complex scenario, this one still works. We're just checking the conditions. There's something in the buffer. Right? Anytime the producer calls, it puts something in the buffer, it wakes us up. And then we check, there's nothing there, because someone stole it, okay, fine, you go back to sleep. So, this is generally, the, unfortunately, generally the case with semaphores. If you have a small constraint problem, you know everyone who's going to be involved and so on, it makes it very elegant, and it's great for homeworks and for like, quizzes. And that's usually how it started in the 50s when Dijkstra came up with this. Right? You don't, didn't actually have any computers that can do this stuff. You just write on paper. So you don't write very large programs. If you have larger programs, yeah, sometimes you have to do this. You don't know, like, okay, so some consumer has now clicked, a, uh, sorry, some user has clicked a bunch of buttons, and now you have some threads running. Some of those threads fell asleep, and they're waiting for the user to move the mouse. All right? So now how do we get this going with semaphores? That's pretty difficult. You have all the threads waiting on a condition variable. And then I move the mouse, whoever knows about the mouse signals the condition variables, all the threads work. Or some of them. Right. So they're used for different things. It's a, it's, a, it's a handy primitive, but you really have to watch out when you use this one. So uh, that's it for today. I would suggest that you don't check out the alternate uh, template alternating template for uh, another couple of hours. It probably doesn't compile on Linux. All right. See you on Monday. Oh, yes, and the homework deadline is extended by a week, but um, this alternating thing is quite can be quite difficult. As you noticed, I didn't even get it right. So um, I propose you start in this weekend.